Right, so the, um, the previous lecture, we were talking about this, these orbital forcings of climate change. So these were changes in the climate that were taking thousands of years, maybe tens of thousand years to hundreds of thousands of years. And then the second part of the lecture, which I guess everybody missed because of the fire alarm, which is now available online, was about shorter term climate variability. So there are those climate change, which maybe happens uh, on a time scale of maybe a thousand years or maybe... Uh, maybe even a bit shorter than that. And that can't be driven by these changes in orbital forcing, okay, because they happen too <coughs> slowly. Okay? So there are, there are a bunch of mechanisms that are basically internal to the climate system okay, that, um, that cause the climate to change from warm to cold, uh, kind, of on a, kind of naturally, um, but not forced by anything outside. So today we're going to kind of carry on that, that theory moving down into more recent times on, on shorter timescales to look at some of the drivers of uh, climate change on essentially on human timescales. Okay. Um, and okay, this is a graph which you, I mean, you should see lots of these kind of, uh, lots of versions of this graph uh, in your time at university. Um, so this is a, a compilation of temperature records from um, basically the pre-industrial period in the kind of like early, uh, well, the late uh, 19th century up until now. And these are uh, basically lots of different ways. So there are four graphs on here. And all these are doing is they're different statistical ways of averaging up all of the surface temperature records that we have. Okay, so these are direct measurements of temperature. But you can imagine, say, maybe in the early 20th century, all of the places where we were measuring the temperature were mostly in Europe, okay, and in kind of, um, uh, I guess, European colonies. Um, and so there weren't a very good kind of geographical spread of measuring temperature. So we weren't measuring the temperature kind of every 1,000 kilometers on a grid across the whole Earth. It was, it was much more kind of spatchy, so the data was sparse and patchy. Um, and these are just basically different statistical methods of, of trying to get a global average from that kind of like poorly distributed data. Okay? And it turns out that it doesn't really matter how you do that kind of statistical exercise, you always get a, uh, this, kind of, this warming trend. So it doesn't really matter how you treat the data. This is a really robust feature. So uh, um, you can see that in the early 20th century, it was a lot colder than it is now. So what we want to do is we want to explain this overall trend, okay? But then there's also there's this, this, this variability within this trend. You can see these kind of like little ups and downs, okay? Um, so we want to try and see if we can explain some of that, that variability. Okay, and the kind of the medium that we're going to use to try to do is this equation, which uh, you will all know and love by now, okay? So we're trying to look at basically what is driving changes in the surface temperature, Okay, so we could think of it, we could maybe, if we're changing the power of the sun, okay, we might be changing the reflectivity of the planet, uh, or we might be changing the emissivity or the absorptivity of the atmosphere. So those are the things, those are the, those are the, the things we've got to play with here, okay, we're going to see if we can use those things to explain some of the variability that we're seeing in the, the surface temperature record of the Earth. Okay, so let's look at the first of those terms. So let's look at the solar flux. So this is, uh, this is a record of the power of the sun. It's a proxy record of the power of the sun. So this is kind of um, the 1600s, um, which is a long time ago, um, to kind of now. And what this is, this is a graph of how many sunspots there are on the sun. And you can see up there on the left, that's a picture of the sun with some black spots on it. I mean, they're not actually black. They're kind of, they're still ridiculously hot, uh, but they're just slightly cooler than the rest of the sun. And it turns out that when the sun has got lots of these sunspots on it, overall, the sun is giving out more energy. Okay, so it go, basically goes through these cycles, uh, which you can see here in blue, of basically going through being powerful and then being slightly less powerful. Okay? Um, so you can see over here, in uh, this period over here, it's called the Maunder Minimum. This was a period of time when there was basically it was very well. There were very few observations of sunspots, so people were still looking for them, but they just weren't there. That was a very strange period in in our, uh, the history of the observations we've making of the sun. And this means that during this period here, 
the, the, um, the, uh, the power of the sun was a bit lower. And it turns out that at that time, okay, the, um, at least the northern hemisphere of the Earth was uh, considerably colder. Okay, so this is the, the period that's kind of commonly referred to as the Little Ice Age. Um, so it's kind of like very cold and miserable. Um, and this is kind of when kind of Scotland kind of collapsed as a country um, because it was just basically very cold. Lots of, um, there was a lot of um, failed harvests um, and um, that kind of led up to the economic disaster that was the kind of like the Darien scheme if you're into your Scottish history. But moving on. Anyway, so can we use that, some of that variation that we were seeing, that cyclicity in, in the sun's power, to explain maybe some of this, this either this long-term trend, so maybe, maybe the sun is getting more powerful over this time, or some of this, these short-term trends. Okay, so the other thing that we're going to consider is, um, is volcanic eruptions. Okay, so a volcano goes off. This is uh, the eruption of Mount Pinatubo in uh, 1991, I think it says up there, 1991, excellent. Um, there's a cow, a scale. Um, so it was a very, very large eruption that happened in the early 90s, and that injected a lot of stuff into the atmosphere, so volcanic ash, which you can kind of see in this, this, this photograph, but also a lot of gases, which are climatically important, okay? So we'll go on to explain why those gases are climatically important and how they might have changed the um, climate. Um, okay, so uh, if we look on first, look at these, these volcanoes. Okay, so this is uh, this is kind of just a cartoon of what happens when a volcano erupts. So it erupts, it, you get this big cloud of ash, and that cloud of ash has got not just ash in it, okay, but it's got these gases in it. So it's got sulfur dioxide, CO2, uh, hydrogen chloride, so chlorine gas. Um, a lot of water as well. Um, and you might think, well, we put all that stuff in the atmosphere, so the ash might rain out, okay, and, and coat the, the earth in kind of like dark ash, okay, and that might have an effect on the albedo, okay, so it depends on what the landscape was beforehand, okay. Um, but that's going to be a very, very local effect, so the ash doesn't actually tend to go that, that far from the volcano to such an extent that it can change the, the colour of the surface. Um, let's think about a little bit more about some of these volcanic gases. So CO2 is going to give out some carbon dioxide in that volcano. So that carbon dioxide is going to be a greenhouse gas. It's going to raise the emissivity of the atmosphere. That's going to lead to a warming. Okay, But it turns out that volcanoes, although they do give out carbon dioxide, any one volcano going off okay, is not going to um, affect the global concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because there is already so much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere already. So the, the flux from any one volcano of CO2 is actually quite small. If you were to change the global rate of volcanism, if you were to suddenly increase mid-ocean ridge spreading or subduction rates or something like that, over very long time scales, then carbon dioxide can be, uh, the, the flux of carbon dioxide from volcanoes can be important. So over maybe um, hundreds of thousands to maybe millions of years, CO2 might be important if you increase the rate of volcanism. But for any one volcano, not so much. Okay? So if you think now about some of the effects of these other gases, and particularly sulfur dioxide. Okay? So sulfur dioxide uh, is one of the forms of, of sulfur that comes out of a volcano. There are many others, depending on the oxidation state of the magma. Um, so you might get hydrogen sulfide which is just a, a more reduced form of uh, sulfur. But as soon as that gets up into the atmosphere, the atmosphere has got lots of oxygen in it, that's going to start to um, basically oxidize that sulfur species, and everything kind of gets turned into, eventually, sulfur dioxide. Okay. Now that's fine. Sulfur dioxide in itself um, I think is a, a greenhouse gas, but sulfur dioxide doesn't hang around as a gas very long in the atmosphere. Okay. What happens is sulfur reacts, sulfur dioxide reacts quite rapidly with any water in the atmosphere, and there's lots of water in the atmosphere, and forms uh, sulfuric acid. So this, this H, uh, H2SO4. Okay, so this species here, sulfur dioxide, you know, reacts with water, maybe some, some uh, photochemistry as well helps out, and that turns it into 
this sulfuric acid. Now, one of the, I mean, you might not know a lot about sulfuric acid, but one of its physical properties is that it has a really, really high boiling point. Okay? So it really doesn't like to be in the gas phase. It really likes to be in the liquid phase. So what happens is that that um, sulf sulfuric acid <coughs> rapidly condenses out into really, really small droplets. Okay, so we have basically droplets of sulfuric acid coming out of our volcano. Okay, so the climate, climatic effect of that is actually quite, um, uh, is kind of indirect. So if you can imagine two versions of the atmosphere, okay? So one of the atmosphere is the top row of diagrams, the other atmosphere at the bottom. So if you look at the, the bottom one first, so if we have lots of particles in our atmosphere, and those particles could be volcanic ash, little tiny bits of volcanic ash, or they could be these droplets of sulf oh, 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 droplet, oh, 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 droplets of sulfuric acid. Okay? And then uh, what happens is that all of these kind of like tiny little particles or droplets in the atmosphere, they act as places where more water can start to condense. Okay, so that will happen. So these droplets then grow in size, <coughs> okay, by just accumulating water from the atmosphere. Okay? And that leads to the formation of a cloud. Right? That's how clouds form. They produce this water vapour that condenses into droplets. Okay? Um, but if you look at the top diagram, if you don't have any, if you don't have anything for the water to start to condense onto, okay, even if you've you've re reduced the, the temperature or, or pressure so that you come below the dew point of water vapour, so it wants to condense, but there's no surface for it to condense onto. Okay, that means that it's harder to form your clouds. Okay? So if you have lots of dust in the atmosphere, lots of sulfuric acid, it's easier to form clouds. Okay? Point one. The next point is, is that if you have, so these, these basically these, these diagrams basically have the same imaginary water content. Now, eventually, if you carry on cooling that parcel of atmosphere, okay, you will eventually start to kind of spontaneously um, precipitate out, or not, sorry, uh, condense out uh, water droplets, okay? But when you do that in a clean atmosphere, those water droplets are gonna form very, very large drops, okay? But in this atmosphere down the bottom, which started dusty, okay, we already have lots of droplets of water, so when it carries on con condensing, when all of the water comes out, and goes into the droplets, there's basically <coughs> lots and lots of places the water can go, so it, it spreads it out, spreads itself out evenly over all of those many droplets. So if you have a, a, a nucleated, okay, so this is called com, um, cloud nucleation, so we're, we're, we're nucleating is just the, basically starting a place where you can start to condense the liquid. So if you have an atmosphere that's dusty or lots of sulfuric acid in it, you'll end up with clouds that have got smaller drops of water in than you would if you had a clean atmosphere and you would also be more likely to form that cloud. So it's more likely to form and it's got smaller droplets in it. Okay? So if your cloud has got smaller drops in it, okay, okay, they're going to rain out less. Okay? Because big drops fall out of the atmosphere faster than small drops. So that means your cloud is going to stay in the atmosphere for longer. In addition to staying in the atmosphere longer, if you have a cloud that's got lots and lots of big droplets, so like a big thunder cloud, they're kind of grey. Yeah, if you look at clouds in Scotland, they're grey because it rains a lot. Big, big droplets. Okay, but clouds that stay in the atmosphere for a very long time, you'll notice that they're very, very white. <coughs> and that difference in colour of the clouds is due to the size of the droplets. Okay, so if we have our volcano goes off, boom, and put lots of particles in the atmosphere of ash and of um, sulfuric acid, okay, we, we add more cloud condensation nuclei to the atmosphere, which leads us to have more clouds, because they're easier to form, the clouds stay in the atmosphere for longer, and they're whiter, okay? So the overall effect of the volcano going off, then, is that actually we... we we increase the albedo of the, the kind of the planets because we're making our we're making 
the whole planet whiter by having more white clouds. Okay? So although a volcano is giving off greenhouse gases, so SO2 is greenhouse gas, um, but that doesn't last very long. Uh, the sulfuric acid um, it forms this stuff, so, but the CO2 is greenhouse gas. So this effect of making the, kind of the atmosphere more reflective okay, vastly overcomes the, the relatively small amount of CO2 that comes out of the volcano. Okay, when I say relatively small, so the, the volcano does give out more CO2 than it gives out SO2, but compared to the concentration that was in the atmosphere, so the atmosphere actually has a very, very low concentration of sulfur dioxide, okay, because it, it forms these clouds which eventually rain out, whereas the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere is much higher compared to the amount that's being added from volcanoes. Okay, so this is, uh, I mean, this is the effect of that eruption. So this is, um, uh, so Mount Pinatubo is, uh, Mount Pinatubo is in the Philippines somewhere, which is kind of uh, in here, one of these islands, okay? Uh, I'm using a red laser pointer on a red background. Here's my laser pointer, there it is, okay? So the effect that happens is that basically we injected, not we, but the, uh, the volcano injected those, um, those aerosols, those ash and sulfate, so in this case we've got sulfur dioxide concentration, into the atmosphere, and that's spread around the whole globe. Okay? So that eruption affected cloud formation over this whole region of red. Okay? So that has an enormous effect on the um, on the uh, you man there. Albedo. It's not so fatigue, of course, or anything, is it? Right. Okay, so if we now look at um, like a, a, a time series of these of volcanic eruptions. So over time, this is the 70s, um, this is the 80s. Um, none of this is relevant to you, but you know, 70s and 80s were good times, if, uh, like disco. Um, but so these these are just when different volcanoes erupted. Okay, um, and what we can see is that that some volcanoes you know, don't have much of an effect on, so this is the amount of aerosol in the, in the atmosphere, so um, dust, volcanic ash, and um, these sulfuric acid droplets. So sometimes the volcano goes off, not much happens. Sometimes the same volcano goes off, okay, you get much more injected up into the atmosphere. Okay, so sometimes a volcano erupts and it's big, and sometimes it erupts and it's small. So the bigger an eruption is, the more likely you are to get this, this stuff up into the atmosphere. Okay, um, and the, the other point that I want to make is, look, if you look at this, uh, this eruption of the volcano uh, Fuego, which I think is in Central America somewhere, it erupts, okay, but the aerosols, they seem to stay in the atmosphere for a very long time, okay, four years it's taken to get back down to back down level. And that's because those, um, those aerosols are injected high up into the atmosphere, okay, into the stratosphere, which we mentioned in earlier lectures, is a region of the atmosphere where it's hotter at the top and colder at the bottom of the, the stratosphere. So it's very well vertically density stable. Okay, so it's not turbulent. So there's, uh, it's very once once something is has got into the stratosphere, it takes a long time for it to fall out of the stratosphere. Okay, the stratosphere is also a lot drier than the the, the troposphere, which is the lower atmosphere. So there's basically there's less rain in the stratosphere. Lots of rain in the troposphere. Uh, that's the bit of the atmosphere that we live in. Okay, and you notice it rains a lot. And that rain basically washes out these aerosols from the atmosphere. Okay. So if you look at another volcano, so you might have heard of Mount St. Helens, right? It's a big volcano in um, uh, in America. Uh, I remember it's in Washington State. But it's, it's up there over on the, the west coast in the Rocky Mountains. And you can see that was an enormous eruption. Okay, it's got the highest aerosol loading of any, um, any of the eruptions on here. So it's kind of set up to here. But you can see it, the aerosols re, re, reduce back down to the background level much, much more rapidly. Okay? And the reason for that is that this volcano erupted in a region of the Earth where it rains a lot. Okay, so in the high, the temperate latitudes, kind of the same latitude as we are here, okay, 
the atmospheric circulation is stuff that we get lots of storms that come across this region, okay, and we're in a region of atmospheric downwelling, uh, and we, um, we wash out all of the, um, the ash, okay? So the climatic impact of volcanoes like Fuego and El uh, Chichon, which is in Mexico, maybe, let's say Mexico, uh, these are tropical eruptions, okay? So stuff gets uh, erupted up into the atmosphere, and it stays there for a lot longer, okay? So the climatic impact of these tropical volcanoes lasts a lot longer than the, uh, these high-latitude volcanoes, okay? Not only that, but the albedo matters a lot more in the tropics than it does at the high latitudes for the global climate because the tropics are facing the sun, whereas the high latitudes are kind of tilted away. Okay? So there's less solar radiation coming in per unit area anyway. Okay, so those are things that determine whether any one volcano will be climatically relevant. So its size, it's a big guy. Okay? Also, it's, um, uh, its location, its latitude. Okay? If, you, if, you, if, you, if you erupt a volcano uh, in, the, in the northern hemisphere, it's very hard for that ash and that, those gases to actually make it into the southern hemisphere. Okay? Whereas if you erupt something near the equator, it's, it's, you, can, you can affect both hemispheres um, more. Okay? So the other um, thing is we can look at basically the climatic effect of different um, volcanoes. So this is um, the temperature change. So this is basically looking at the, the global average temperature and how much it reduced after each eruption. So here we've got Mount St. Helens. So when that erupted, okay, we've got 10 to the minus one, so 0.1 of a degree. The global temperature was 0.1 of a degree colder after Mount St. Helens erupted. Okay, so although it was the highest amount of kind of aerosols in the atmosphere, it had a relatively small climatic impact. Okay? Um, whereas some of these other eruptions had uh, a much larger climatic impact, and in this case, one of the things that's determining whether um, uh, you have a climatic impact on it is, is basically how much, so this is basically how much sulfur the volcano erupts into the atmosphere. So it turns out that is the most important thing. And these other, because you get a really, really tight relationship, good correlation between the amount of sulfur and the, um, and the climatic impact. So this is basically the primary driver of, of, of the climatic impact. These other things, so uh, the latitude um, uh, and things like, uh, things like the latitude and, and how high the eruption column and things like that is, that, those are secondary drivers. So this is basically the, determined from the amount of sulfur in kind of in the volcano times the size of the volcano. So if you have a small eruption that's not got a lot of sulfur per kind of mass of rock, um, you can come down here. But if you have a much larger eruption, okay, so Tambora was um, as a super eruption uh, from Indonesia. Uh, Laki was uh, is a flood basalt eruption from, from Iceland. Um, and these were huge eruptions, but they also had high sulfur concentrations in those eruptions. So the total amount is basically the size of the eruption times the concentration. So the amount of sulfur you put in the atmosphere is strongly related to the temperature effect of that, that eruption. Okay, so we can also look at, um, you know, a more, look at this from a more kind of proxy related kind of like point of view. So if you drill down into the Greenland ice core, okay, you can get a proxy measure of temperature, okay, using one of these isotope proxies, maybe measuring the oxygen isotopes of the ice itself. That can be used as a proxy for the, the temperature at which that ice, that snow fell. And you can also measure the acidity of the ice. Okay, so you can, you can melt the ice, then measure the pH of the, of the water that's fresh through. And that is, so the ice basically gets that acidity from uh, basically volcanic gases precipitating out and raining down onto the, onto the ice sheet, um, from the rock, the, the, the flecks of uh, volcanic ash as they dissolve in the ice over time, they release acids. So when you have uh, a high 
acidity, okay, that suggests that you've got more volcanoes going off kind of that kind of like decade or, or whatever. Okay. So we can see here in these graphs, okay, so this is the acidity. So this is when we've got lots of acidity, this is when we've got not lots of acidity. Okay, so this, this would suggest this time here we've got more volcanoes going off though that century. Okay. And if we look at the temperature proxy record, we can see that typically is a colder period. So there is quite a, quite a, quite a basically an empirical relationship between when volcanoes go off, the climate gets colder. Okay. On short timescales, on kind of this hundred year timescale. On much longer timescales, the average rate of volcanism determines the CO2 in the atmosphere. So that's, uh, that's awesome. Okay, so you get the same effect if you had a large meteorite. So one of the, the, the so this is just a meteorite crater in Arizona, but we have large uh, meteorite impacts, kind of like the, um, the one in the Yucatan Peninsula that was thought to be responsible for the demise of the dinosaurs and, and ammonites and things like that. So that would have put a whole bunch of dust and in terms of, in, ter in, in the case of the Yucatan Peninsula, it would have also put an enormous amount of sulfur in the atmosphere because it happened to hit sediments that were, were sulfur rich. Would have put all of that sulfur and, and dust into the atmosphere and would have led to kind of global cooling through increased albedo of clouds. Okay? So uh, meteorite impacts are much like volcanic eruptions in terms of their climatic impact. Okay, so there you go. There was some, there's, a, there's a cartoon of a mega death thing. Okay, so now I should also probably mention that we've got this uh, this kind of this issue of, uh, of geoengineering. So this is kind of becoming more of a uh, less of a kind of like scientists kind of like musing over what we might do, but this is more uh, becoming into the kind of public consciousness is that we could actually manipulate the upper atmosphere. Okay. To, pr to basically mimic the effects of a volcano. So kind of a volcano might go off and that will put lots of aerosols and uh, sulfur dioxide up into the atm high atmosphere, into the stratosphere, and that will create lots of white clouds. Okay? But we can, we can mimic that ourselves. So we could, we could, uh, we could get a ship, okay? we could tow it out into the ocean, okay? and we could then spray, get a big balloon and a, and a pipe, uh, and we could spray sea salt up into the atmosphere, okay, that sea salt would crystallize, those, those, those particles of sea salt would act as cloud con condensation nuclei, okay, we could also just pump sulfuric acid up into the sky, and that's kind of a little bit more controversial, but we could do that. Um, I mean, it's actually, I mean, it's technically trivial, I mean, very easy to do, very cheap. If you were, if you were, uh, you know, if you were a large kind of independent minded, minded country, you could do this. If you were a rich individual, you could do this. Okay, so if Richard Branson decided that he wanted to just do this, he could just he could do it. There's nothing to stop him. But anyway, you could do that, and that would create an artificial cloud which would cool the planet. Okay? There were lots of issues with this in terms of it would also have effects on where rain actually falls. So you could use this as a climate weapon if you were if you were a less charitably minded independent country. Um, you could, uh, I mean, there would be obviously nasty side effects of this thing. So, I mean, one of the arguments against doing this kind of thing is that you would manipulate the weather patterns, and that would be bad. But, you know, we're manipulating weather patterns already by putting CO2 into the atmosphere. Um, other, other, other issues is if you started doing this, you could never stop. Okay, because if you stop doing it, then all of the, the CO2 emissions that are built up in the atmosphere because you weren't worried about stopping CO2 emissions, they would still be in the atmosphere. So when you stop doing this, you'd get an enormous rapid warming. So that would suck. Um, but anyway, so these are, these are kind, of the, kind of issues of governance, of kind of monitoring, of uh, whether it's technically feasible, things like that, which are kind of exciting things to be, um, to be thinking about at you know, a university. But anyway. Okay, so... Uh, moving back to see if we can explain our temperature records. Okay, so at the beginning of the, uh, the lecture, I mentioned the uh, the possibility of the 
are variations in the solar flux, okay, the solar radiation, are they responsible for um, the, the increase in temperatures or even that variability in temperatures? Okay. So what this, this graph is, is basically it's a compilation of all of the different things that are happening to, um, to basically alter this equation down here. Okay. So if we look at the, uh, the gray curve here, this is basically what we would expect the climate forcing to look like if, we, if the climate was only forced by those volcanoes. Okay. So every time a volcano goes off, we get one of these spikes down and it should get colder. So our radiative forcing basically goes down. <coughs> okay. Uh, if we were just thinking about the greenhouse gases, so if we just thought CO2 just does everything, okay, then that would be the green curve at the top there. Okay. And there are a whole bunch of other things. So we're changing the land use, basically changes the, the colour of the ground, turning forests into farms, makes them more shiny. Um, melting snowpack, okay, removing the snow. But these are, these are, small, these are small beans, right? These, these guys are small problems. Okay. So on this graph, you can just about see the effect of changing solar irradiance. Okay, so the amount, so the sun's been going through those sunspot cycles. Okay, and that they're represented by this orange curve, which goes up, down, up, down. Those, so these these wiggles are the solar cycle of more sunspots, less sunspots, fewer sunspots. Um, but you can see the overall trend is nowhere near as important as the greenhouse gas trend. Okay? So that suggests that we cannot explain all of the warming with just the sunspots uh, or just the changes in solar radiation. And in fact, we can't explain the temperature rise with any one of these forcings, which is kind of obvious. There's, all these things are happening, so they must all be uh, driving the, 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 the climate. Okay, so if we kind of add up all of those forcings, we get kind of this, this curve at the top, this black curve, and that's kind of starting to look a little bit like our temperature record here. Okay, so there's an overall uptrend, okay, that matches our temperature rise, but uh, it's not quite right, is it? Okay, so one of the reasons it's not quite right is because these spikes down, okay, are very, very transient features, okay? So the actual, the temperature of the Earth, so the temperature has quite, the Earth has quite a, a large heat capacity because it's very big, it's got things like the ocean in it, which have got a really high heat capacity of water. So actually, if you have a very short-lived forcing, even though if it's very, very big forcing, so these volcanic eruptions should cool the planet a lot, uh, they do appear in these records. So that, that big guy up there is, is this guy here, and then the next one down there is, is this guy here. Okay? But they're not, they're muted, because they're not long enough lasting to affect the climate over multiple years. But even then, we're seeing, for instance, in... In this period here, it's pretty constant forcing, but we are seeing lots of variability in the climate system. Okay? And this is just another graph that kind of shows, shows that kind of stuff. Um, and we're just going to go on and try and explain why we have this, this extra noise or extra variability in the climate system. So this is uh, basically what we're going to go through now is to explain a phenomenon called the El Nino system, or the ENSO system, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Okay, which you've probably heard of before. But uh, what we've got here is we've got a, a, a graph that shows the pressure anomalies at two places on the Earth, at Tahiti and Darwin. And these are basically chosen uh, because this is where this phenomenon was first kind of like figured out. Uh, and it was figured out here because those places have got long records of atmospheric pressure. So these are not, this graph is not, um, oh, anyway. so we, you can combine those those pressure records, basically looking at the difference between the pressure in Tahiti and the pressure in, in Darwin, in Australia, and looking at the, 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 basically the difference for that month relative to the average dif difference for that month over a long climate record. Okay? And we can see that sometimes, um, so basically this equation down here, so the pressure at Tahiti minus the pressure in Darwin, relative to the long-term average, and it's normalized to the variability that we would e basically expect to get, okay? So on average, we should get zero, because it should be like the average most of the time. Um, but when we have these downward spikes, that means that the pressure at Tahiti is lower than it would otherwise be normally. 
Okay? So when we have a low pressure in Tahiti, we're down here. When we have a, a high pressure at Tahiti, we're kind of up here. So the reason this is important is because the atmosphere also determines in the ocean. Okay, so these are normal conditions. Okay, so the wind, the trade winds blow from, from east to west and they pile up warm water over on the west side of the Pacific. Okay, that causes there to be atmospheric upwelling because this warm water is heating the atmosphere. The atmosphere is heated from below, remember? Okay, so that causes there to be um, uh, rising air here. Okay, so there's this circulation of, of air, it's called the Walker circulation, and this basically feeds the trade winds again. So this is basically self-reinforcing. Okay, so these winds blow stronger. Okay, we pile up more hot water over here, which makes this warm air rise here, and this kind of makes this cycle go around more and more and more. Okay, so this leads to uh, a relatively low pressure underneath that big cloud. Okay, because the air is kind of that's where when you have rising air, you have low pressure. You have falling air, you have high pressure. Okay, and this is kind of a map of the surface temperature of the Pacific, and you can kind of see that it's kind of warm over that side. Okay, but in an El Nino year, something happens that means that that wind starts to blow less vigorously, less vigorously from this side, which means that it's not pushing the water as fast, as hard. So the water starts to flow back over the central Pacific here, and that means that this upwelling of air okay, moves from over here to over here. So this means now over Tahiti, which is about here, we have a low pressure, okay, and we have a relatively high pressure over Darwin, which is kind of over here, and it means that the, this warm water has spread out more over the Pacific. Okay, so the area of hot water is bigger, okay, and it's, and it's particularly bigger over this side of the Pacific here. Okay, and this is basically maps of that. So this is the normal condition up here on the top, uh, top right. This is that, this, that warm water is pushed over to the, um, the right, to the west. But when those winds kind of weaken, okay, the atmospheric forcing stops it being pushed over there and it kind of flows back over to the, um, the east. Okay. Um, and that leads to, and you can just see that there's a much bigger area of warm water in the Pacific now. Okay? So that means that uh, that warm area of warmth is now heating the atmosphere more. Okay? Okay, and this is, this is an example of, of how one of these things develops. This is not the actual temperature, this is the temperature anomaly now. So this is basically the difference from the, the average temperature. This is one of these events where um, yeah, so in 1998, uh, this is warm water rushed from over this side, over in the west, to the, to the east. Okay, forcing this, ow, this really warm patch of water over in the, in the east. Okay, and th that, that process is happening now. Okay, so we are in, currently uh, approaching the, the, one, of the most, one of the strongest El Nino events ever. Okay, so 2015 will be, um, well, we'll see what the effects are. Okay, so these are, these are the kind of effects that happen. So when we're in a, uh, um, when we're in a normal um, La Nina year, okay, we've got lots of warm water over here. Okay, that causes lots and lots of, of rain, lots of convective <coughs> clouds and stuff like that. So this region over here gets lots of rainfall. This region does not get any rainfall. Okay, North America, very, very wet. And actually over the last kind of the last uh, four or five years, we've been in the situation where the, the, the earth has been in this state. Okay, so there's been a, an enormous drought in North America, California, lots of wildfires, they've run out of water, they can't water their, their garden and stuff like that, which is, you know, disaster. Um, and lots of like heavy rain and stuff over the Philippines. Okay. Now, hopefully the next slide is the case. Okay, it is not, but anyway. But when, when it flips back the other way, Okay, that means we get, we, get, we get droughts over here because the rain has moved from being over here to over here. So at the moment, there are lots of forest fires, lots of smog in the atmosphere over the Philippines, lots of anthropogenic, but usually that, that pollution would be washed out of the atmosphere by rain. Okay, so this is a pretty unpleasant place in the world at the moment. Uh, and the drought in California is basically starting to ease. 
Okay. Okay, so we can look, we can look back through time and see that we've got this basically index, basically how another index other than the um, uh, the pressure difference between the Tahiti and Darwin is basically how warm the water is over in, in, in basically uh, some artificial box in the in the eastern Pacific. Okay, so when we're when that bit of ocean is warmer than usual, we're in a an El Nino state. So that's kind of like. Uh, 1998 was was here. Okay, and this is us now. Okay, we're shooting off up into this is going to be disastrous. Okay, so when when that when that happens, if we look at zoom in on the last kind of this is last kind of maybe 15 years of that <coughs> temperature of the water in the Pacific at the top. So this is called the El El Nino 3.4 region, which is just kind of uh, a box in the ocean that we say what's the average temperature of the water in that box relative to the long-term average temperature of water in that box. So is it anomalously warm or anomalously cold? And what we've got at the bottom is, uh, this is a, a basically a zoom in of the uh, temperature anomaly of the world. This is the surface temperature. So it's basically the last bit of that graph that I showed you at the beginning of the lecture. So you can see that we're, we're much above the average. So zero is the kind of the, the 1960 to 70, 1950 to 70, something like that average temperature. So you can see that kind of the, the 2000s is already clearly warmer than that. And you could just about make out that there's a trend on this data. So the Earth is, has been continually warming over the last 15 years. Okay, but there's this really high frequency noise on it. So when people say, oh, well, the warming stopped in 1998, the, the Earth is basically saying a constant temperature, that's because we can't see, we've got this high frequency noise that's masking this long term trend. So if we get all crazy with PowerPoint, we can see when we superimpose these two graphs now, we can see that when El Nino is uh, in its kind of like El nino -y red state, it's kind of like in positive El Nino phase, so we've got that warm water spread over to the um, east side of the Pacific, the global temperatures are typically higher than they would normally be. Whereas we're in a La Nina state, and kind of we've been in a La Nina kind of state for the last kind of like four, four, five years. You can see that the, the global temperatures are lower than we would expect. Okay, so this this suggests that almost well most of this high frequency variation that we're seeing, kind of in variation in temperature from one year to the next in the global temperature, is basically caused by this El Nino system where we're basically moving warm water around the Pacific. Okay. We're piling up all on one side, which makes the area of warm water very small, which means that it can't heat the atmosphere as much. Whereas if we spread that warm water out over the Pacific, it means that there's more atmospheric heating. Because remember, the atmosphere is heated from below. Okay, so these... Uh, we go control. These wiggles up and down are basically this internal climate variability in terms of uh, we're transferring heat from the ocean into the atmosphere. And whether it's an El Nino or not an El Nino determines how effective that transfer of heat is. Okay? But the overall trend in this thing is caused by greenhouse gases um, uh, with some of, these, some of these unexpected blips down being caused by volcanic eruptions.